thanks a lot for having me. Um, I pronounce it with a hard G as GIF. I feel like this is like announcing our pronouns or something. Uh, and I don't have I don't have skin in the game. Uh, I'm a historian and anthropologist, and I just sort of um, respond to uh, what exists. And I just grew up saying that. And we both we all know what we mean when we say it. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't I don't really care. Um, okay, so um, if you can peek behind there. Uh, so I'm the curator of digital media at Museum of the Moving Image. The museum is dedicated to film, uh, television, and digital media, whatever the hell that means in 2016. Um, I define my role there as uh, looking at art, play, and vernacular culture. Um, so um, I'm gonna sort of just talk about a few exhibitions that I've organized that involve gifts. Um, um, and there's two sort of concerns that I think are going to sort of pop up and play through all of these. Um, one is um, I just want to sort of define sort of my approach to this. Um, uh, I'm interested in sort of culture as a whole, and I see art as sort of a subset of culture. Um, we can draw our own diagrams later if we want, but that's just like a, an easy sort of metaphor to sort of think about um, what we're looking at. Uh, and second, um, uh, and this sort of answers one of Anna's questions. Um, uh, I'm really interested in sort of um, authorship or like sort of lack of authorship and lack of ownership as it, as it um, relates to gifts and sort of the sort of technologically determinist answers for why, why that exists. Um, so I'll sort of like touch on both of those ideas as we go through these exhibitions. Um, so the first uh, exhibition that I organized um, at the museum about animated gifts was called We Tripped El Haji Diouf. Um, and I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going like, to be blowing through all this, um, so I apologize in advance. But um, in 2011, this animated GIF was posted to a Something Awful forum, uh, also with the GIF that's about to follow, where the person who tripped that soccer player um, was removed. And the poster, uh, who went by T. Fine at the time, said, um, hey, I, I found this GIF. Uh, I think that um, you guys are really creative, and you guys can come up with a lot of really amazing uh, ideas for what tripped El Haji Diouf. Um, this is a Photoshop thread, which was a, a common recurring thing on, on something awful, um, which sort of, yeah. So um, over the course of uh, a couple weeks, um, more than 100 really amazing uh, remixes came in. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just let it speak for itself. This is a callback to a 2006 um, Photoshop thread. <laughs> Someone then created an 8-bit eight, eight sprite and passed it around. Um. Um, so, oh, no, there are more, I'm sorry. <clears throat> What's great about these is like there's, there's, Lots of like responses, like the one with Homer, like <coughs> was later in the in the process. So like you kind of knew what was coming, but you like there's that anticipation that's being built. So this is really amazing play that was happening, and so I was I was interested in this this thread, and it's it it's still sort of known as like the most epic Photoshop thread um, on the web. Uh, what was interesting to me was that um, people are creating sort of what we understand as like. Um, uh, they're creating these cultural artifacts that are in this medium that we would usually sort of, I think, consider art because it's a, it's a visual medium. It's things that are, um, you know, video or whatever, but but just solely sort of uh, as playful conversation. Um, so um, so um, I wanted to sort of tell the story of how um, this sort of from these humble beginnings, um, this like amazing explosion of creativity uh, came out through this through this uh, thread by people who don't self-identify as artists and are you know are not making claims to art they're simply sort of using the tools that are available to them um, uh, in a vision like to communicate not just you know 
um, to communicate visually. Um, so, um, so I selected 33 that um, were both accessible and of high quality and, and diverse. Um, uh, and then, um, what? so then um, this website, The Verge, came and um, did a video, a quick video about it. Um, and this scene happens. And then um, the something awful people get a hold of it. <laughs> And yeah, and insert doof in the back. And then, um, so of course, this piece has been up a couple times. So I added that to the exhibition the next time it went up. Um, but also, this amazing artifact came out of this. This is Ferris Bueller's Day Off, if you don't recognize the, the scene. Kind of weird in the context of this video, but. <laughs> the gift in the back was not part of the exhibition, but it was one that everyone in the and who was sort of part of the community thought was an egregious error that I left out, um, and so this is sort of their way of like inserting it back into um, into the sort of narrative of this. So this is made by, I don't even know his real name, I know it is Hop Wallace, um, who also made like the um, Wizard of Oz uh, gift that you saw earlier. Um, what else do I wanna say about that? That's enough, okay. So um, I'll just touch on this one briefly, uh, and I'm glad Patty sort of touched on um, early web. This was just um, an exhibition that um, just, yeah, yeah, looked at uh, under construction animated gifts um, to sort of tell the story of, of the early web. So briefly, um, if, if the early web was sort of this super uh, information superhighway, um, uh, people who were publishing on the web were trying to sort of like identify what was unique, what was different about the web and all the things we could do. And one of those was like, oh, we can have sort of like these blinky, colorful things that enliven this, this what, we, what we're publishing and like, isn't that exciting? Look at all the cool things that we can do. Uh, and so if, if the web is the information superhighway, um, it's always under construction because it's always changing. We're not, we're not limited to like, uh, deadlines where we have to print it and it's done. It can always be evolving and changing. Um, so as a result, um, uh, these GIFs, images and, and animated images emerged um, to sort of celebrate this fact and to sort of, this is idea, it was sort of this idea that, um, uh, you know, a good, a good web page was always, um, was always under construction, right? You don't, you, you never finish your website. Um, of course, pretty quickly, um, there were lots of pages that were unfinished that sort of left abandoned where these, lingered and they soon sort of became a joke um, and um, in fact it's sort of GeoCity which was really the sort of the biggest like the um, largest space where people were sort of first experimenting with like how they were um, didn't like uh, performing their identities online was was a real big space for this um, and they sort of became equated with, e with each other in a way um, up to the point where when Yahoo decided that they were gonna close it down in 2009, almost all the writing about it was like good riddance. What a, you know, what a pock on, you know, what, a, what an awful mark on our history. Um, thankfully, Jason Scott, who's a, a rogue archivist um, who now uh, works at um, the Internet Archive, um, rallied a bunch of uh, um, like-minded people to just start downloading pages um, and amassed about a terabyte of, of data um, before Yahoo finally pulled the plug about seven months after they announced they were shutting down uh, GeoCities. Uh, and to sort of like 
prove um, sort of what an amazing sort of cultural heritage he had um, uh, saved, he, he searched and found every instance of an under construction image or gift that he could find. Um, and I worked with that, I think there were about 1,000 that he found. I sort of worked through a bunch of duplicates, and we presented 322 of them. Many of them you'll see are very similar, but are have distinct different, like, or very nuanced differences in timing or, you know, um, encoding, stuff like that. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's that. Um, and then uh, Anna um, mentioned this exhibition. So this is something that um, I did two years ago. So um, actually starting in 2011, I started noticing um, uh, that I was seeing a lot of animated GIFs being posted in lieu of text uh, online in message boards and emails. Um, and these are two that you're probably most familiar with, um, uh, Orson Welles clapping or Michael Jackson eating popcorn. Um, and those, I think, are they have very specific. When you see this, I think that we all, or most of us, have a sense of what it means when, when, it, when we see that. Um, and so I sort of started thinking about um, these reaction GIFs and divided them into two categories, one being hypothetical. Um, you see these a lot like on Tumblr, um, often framed as like my reaction when or that feeling when or how I feel when, um, where someone sort of posits uh, um, a situation and yeah, and then you sort of um, perform a reaction to that hypothetical situation. <laughs> Uh, and then what I what I called actual reaction gifts, where you are actually reacting with a gif. So this is in a uh, comment thread to that Verge video, um, uh, where some, there are people are arguing about how you pronounce gif up there, and so people are very heated about it. Um, so I just I, I, I was like so I thought a lot about so what role is the reaction gif playing in, in our language online? Um, and here's what I settled on: is that um, for most of uh, humanity we've been an oral culture. Um, we communicate um, through speech or, or person to person. And only recently, you know, perhaps starting with the printing press, have we um, more and more been communicating asynchronously in, in these other ways. Um, so how does that sort of map? You know, so um, oral culture has speech, prosody, and gesture. Um, and when you translate that to um, sort of literate culture, um, speech is pretty similar to text, right? Uh, I think text treatment sort of stands in for prosody, like font and punctuation and capitalization are sort of like volume and intonation and rhythm. But like, where's the space for gesture? Um, maybe emoticons uh, and inc increasingly emojis fill, fill that space, but my argument was that um, reaction GIFs um, are sort of a, uh, our way of, of fill filling in that spot for what we're how we're used to communicating, how we communicate as a species for most of our existence um, in, in the digital space. So um, with, that, with that in mind, um, I went to Reddit and I said, hey, um, I think this is like a, um, so when, sorry, went to back up. One thing I decided to do is to focus on actual reaction gifts because I thought that for a general audience, it would be easier to sort of explain um, uh, that sort of process of using a reaction gift versus a hypothetical reaction gift. And I think Reddit is one of the um, ground zeros for, um, for actual reaction gifts. So I, I posted this to Reddit. Um, which was basically, uh, if you had to describe a reaction GIF to your grandmother, which one would you show and how would you describe them? So it was like basically like, help me sort of come up with a canon um, and, and sort of define, define them. Um, so I got a lot of really great uh, responses. Um, and, I, and I think it really sort of, um, I, I think it's sort of, the diversity was really great in that, um, um, I think this, this is really evident. Um, this is of course a classic. Um, but it was, I think it was really important, like how um, they're, they're, these aren't word, you know, these aren't words. There's something different. There's something uh, specific and nuanced about them. Um, and some of them are like really important in context, right? So this is one that you wouldn't, I think, ever use in a physical space. It's very much about um, being on a on a thread or being um, involved in something online that you're like sort of gesturing that you're backing away from. This is the most verbose, uh, and I think it like captures it really well. Um, and this was the least verbose, but I think also captured it really well. Um, and I think even those two words are, you know, there's a lot more writing on those two words than, the, you know, the face value. Um, so um, I selected, I think, 35 of those, um, and they are organized sort of by sentiment. Um, and, and yeah, so that's, that's that exhibit. Um, and then briefly, um, uh, How Castle Grove Internet closes on Sunday, um, so you still have an opportunity to see it. Um, 
it is not just about gifts, but it uh, is obviously very important. Gifts are a very important part of that. Um, so how Cats Go Internet looks at um, cats online as vernacular culture, um, how people are uh, posting uh, video and images and, and gifts and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and um, yeah, in, in what that all means. So briefly, there's a section that's like cats didn't exist. Cats existed before the internet, and, and uh, which you know might need to be reminded of that. Um, timeline, um, starting with Meow Chat, which is actually a really interesting phenomenon, but it's not a gift, so we won't talk about it. Um, uh, part where we sort of actually look at the data, um, lots of sort of explanations, um, thinking about anthropomorphism. Um, and also, like, what was really important to me was like look at sort of the global phenomenon. Is are cats really that popular over the world? They're not. And um, it's interesting to sort of zoom out because you sort of look at how cats um, uh, are, you know, any sort of internet phenomenon is a reflection of like shared cultural local values. So whereas cats are popular in North America and Western Europe and Russia and China and Japan, um, they're not in Africa, they're not in the Middle East uh, because they're seen as pests or there's just like superstition about them, stuff like that. Um, so I'll, I'll end it there. Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Like we, so I was curious about the popularity of cats online because I'm a dog person. And so I, um, did like a Google Analytics search to see like how cats did online versus dogs because yeah. I thought, well, obviously cats are all over the place, but dogs win. Yep. Did that come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in the show. Yeah, by most measures, yeah. dogs are about even, if not a little more popular. So um, briefly, um, you're not bearing that knowledge. But, but this cat is kind of. Uh, so no, no, no. Why, it's definitely present so there. So why <laughs> is it that we think that cats rule the internet when it's really dogs? You should come see the exhibit. But um, <laughs> this is, I, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Um, do we have time to answer that? I, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so there's not. I think as humans, we look for like the the, the the simple narrative that like explains it all, and there's not one. Right. Um, there's lots of little sort of pieces that all add up. Um, the place to start with this is to to say to first look at when we're asking why is it cats. Why is it cats? We're really saying why is it cats and not dogs? So just want to sort of limit limit sort of where we're picking picking from here. It's not sloths. It's not hedgehogs. And the reason for that is primarily that um, the media that we are creating and posting um, is with our pets that we have in close proximity to us. So whereas pandas might have a, a hot couple weeks, uh, there are not enough people with network cameras next to pandas to sort of sustain that growth. So it's often like when we're at home bored. And we're gonna pull out our camera. We're gonna shoot our kids, and we're gonna shoot our um, our pets with our cameras. So that's starting with that. Um, um, the next thing to talk about is this idea of the virtual cat park. So Jack Shepard at BuzzFeed coined this term to talk about how dog owners have social spaces where they can gather with their dogs, but cat owners do not. So the internet has become this virtual cat park where um, cat enthusiasts can be social uh, about their cats. Um, and the third one, the third thing I talk about is. Um, Pluralistic ignorance, that's what it was. Um, so it's this, pluralistic ignorance is a sociological idea where um, a majority of people or a large minority can hold an opinion uh, but think that they're, it's not as popular as it is, um, but suddenly um, they discover that they're not the only ones holding this, this idea and it seems like there's this like critical, like this um, critical mass has overflow really quickly, this transformation, when in fact a lot of these people still held these ideas. So um, I think part of this is that um, Cat owners, well, yeah, I mean, you know, we have this term crazy cat lady, which is like a, like a negative gender term for people who are enthusiastic about their cats. And um, I think for a long time, I've talked to a lot of people who say that they were sh ashamed or felt shameful about um, sort of their enthusiasm about their cat. But now that um, sort of there's this renewed attention on cats online, um, these people who've sort of kept their enthusiasm quiet have recognized, oh, um, uh, it's okay to be enthusiastic about my cat. And so it sort of appears like overnight there's this big transformation. So I think that sort of along with this idea that dogs have always sort of been like the American animal, um, um, partly partly honestly influenced by the fact that they're easier to train, so they're more present in media. Um, if you sort of think back to, um, you know, we did, we did a, a, part of this thing that didn't make it in the exhibit, unfortunately, was sort of this analysis of feature films and television shows that feature animals, uh, and it's primarily dogs and horses because they're easy to train and they're easy, you know, they're, they're um, telegenic. Um, so there's sort of this enforced narrative and then all of a sudden there's like this other way that people are accessing and sharing media and all of a sudden it's like, oh, 
all these cats are popular again. So that's the that's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs>